Hello and welcome to the Healthy Runner Podcast. And I am here with me, myself, and I because this is the Ask Dwayne episode in which we crowdsourced your questions and you guys had some great questions. So I wanted to jump on here and share some of these great questions that you asked during this episode, because I've never done anything like this. So I wanted to give it a whirl. And no, I am not wearing my Gooder running vacation sunglasses because I want to look cool. It is strictly for function because I literally cannot see most of you actually starting to starting to come down here, the sun angle. I feel like I'm at like Yankee Stadium right now working in the shadows. Um, For those that don't know, I have been in a temporary uh, work station set up at my home because we are getting uh, work done on our kitchen and it is like pretty much 98% there. It's a full functioning kitchen right now. Um, There's just a little bit of paint that needs to be done, but I am out here in the sunroom and we don't have shades on our windows. So I got a nice little glare, but now I can actually open my eyes and see you guys. So in a couple of minutes, this should go down a little bit. Shadows will be a little bit better. Uh, So hang in there and let me know if you guys can hear me okay. Those that are jumping on Facebook, on the live, um, just type in uh, live into the comment box. Uh, Let me know that you can hear me. And I just want to make sure. Okay. Awesome. Linda, how are you? Thank you so much for jumping on here. And thank you so much for joining our team 5K program. Um, For those of you that uh, don't know while I'm waiting for those kind of get on here on the live, I just announced uh, yesterday, I guess unofficially, today is the first day of a five-day enrollment period for our new runners, our beginner runners, our 5K runners. Uh, We have a team program just for you that just launched today, actually. And I am super excited about this. This is our program that has helped over 100 and some odd runners this past year, uh, training for different half marathons. And now we have a half marathon and marathon training program that kicked off three weeks ago. So this is the program with our team of uh, healthy runner coaches that provide you the run plan, the strength plan, the accountability, support, community, motivation to be able to hit your race goals. And now we have that for either a couch to 5k program with our coach extraordinaire, Coach Cat, uh, who specializes in the Couch to 5K program, as well as 5K program to be able to crush your fall 5K race. So if you've thought about or liked uh, hearing about some of our programs before, but you're like, you know what, listen, I'm just not up for half marathon distance yet. And you know, I'm, I don't want to put that much training in. I don't have that much time to do those long runs on the weekends. Um, this 5k program I'm super excited about, but guys, you need to get in here quick because it's five day blitz. We're doing five days for 5k to be able to actually, uh, crush your 5k this fall because training starts next Monday. So training starts, um, Monday, that would be the 9th. So August 9th training is going to start and we are training for an October 3rd 5k. So if you have a 5k in and around that time period, we can customize that for you and your race day. But we are training for um, the October 3rd race, which is locally here, the Southington Apple Harvest Festival. Um, I'm very proud to be a community partner with the Southington YMCA and the Southington Apple Harvest Festival. And I'm actually going to go live here within the Healthy Runner Facebook group tomorrow with the race organizer, John Myers, who's going to share a little bit about this actually local community event, this local community race. And I'm super excited uh, to have him on uh, tomorrow to share about, uh, to know a little bit more of the background of the race. So for those of you who are local here in Connecticut and you're looking for a fall uh, 5K to do, this is an amazing race. So we're going to be there as community partners. I would love to see as many healthy runners 
uh, attending the Southington Apple Harvest uh, Festival this year. So if you want to learn more about the event, tune in to our live that I'm going to do uh, here with John tomorrow. So this would be August 3rd. Um, within the Healthy Runner Facebook group at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're going to have John on and learn a little bit more about that event. And for those of you who um, might be considering, either you checked out our program, this is the first time you've, you've heard about our program, what we're going to be doing is a little uh, contest giveaway uh, for those who are local in Connecticut and you want to run the Southington Apple Harvest 5K and you're thinking about joining our team, uh, healthy runner coaching program, then if you want free race day registration, I'm going to throw these back on uh, my shades just because I'm getting blinded by light. But if you want free race day registration, um, we're going to hook you up for a free race registration. If you join our team, just all you need to do here on Facebook, this is just for those of us on the uh, Healthy Runner Facebook Live, type in contest into the comment box and we'll take care of your registration. Um, so I'm gonna be giving one of those away for those that attend the uh, live today. And then we'll see about uh, giving some more away. So you get some free race uh, registration if you join our team and join our program. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the team program, definitely check out the link in the comment box on Facebook. I'll drop that after I'm done today uh, so you can learn more about that program. Um, and if you're really interested in the team, just type in team into the comment box. I'll reach out to you. I'll send you a message and answer any of your questions about uh, the team. So thank you so much for those that have jumped on here on the live and I could see that Francisco is here, that Linda's here, Amber's here. What's going on, Amber? You are crushing your training with our team. Kathy, thanks so much for joining. Coach Whitney's here. Uh, Coach Kat is here, and she can hear me. Awesome. Teresa, you are crushing your training as well. I'm so proud of you. Uh, thanks for jumping in here. Christy, man, man, we got all the winners here today. Uh, and Francisco here as well. Um, awesome. Thank you guys for letting me know that you're here. Sorry about the shades, but literally I'm blinded by the light right now. So hopefully you can somewhat see my uh, silhouette. But I am super excited to get into this episode because first off, I need to thank all of you guys, the listeners. I literally put out one post out there on Instagram uh, within our Healthy Runner Facebook group, as well as those on my email list. And your response was amazing. So I got a total of 32 questions um, that were submitted for this episode. I highly doubt we're going to be able to get to all 32 because trust me, you do not want to just hear me, myself, and I for you know over an hour. So I'm going to need to cut this off whenever we get to our time stop uh, just to make sure that we're not uh, going too far over and we keep this within somewhat of a listening uh, realm. So you guys know me, I could talk. And I could probably talk for hours about some of the questions that you guys asked. But those that are here on the live, if you have any follow-up questions to the ones, I definitely want to get to you know, what you've already submitted. But those that are on live, if you have anything to add, uh, maybe you've had experience with uh, these types of questions, these types of issues, these types of problems that our running community is facing, then drop it in the comment box. And if you have follow-up questions, I'll be happy to do follow-up questions. Um, especially if it's your question that you submitted. Um, so I am super excited to get into this. This is the first time that we've ever really crowdsourced questions. And this was kind of fun to get all your questions. So if, if you guys like this, then we can do this on like a regular, you know, we can do this like every six, eight, 10 episodes, whatever we figure out is a good, um, you know, format to do. And I, I love, I love hearing from you guys, the listeners, honestly. And, you know, every time like today I jumped on um, calls with two longtime listeners and like, I always just love hearing from you. And it, it's just, I, I still find it like amazing that anyone even listens to this, honestly. Um, so kudos to you if you're listening to the podcast, you're out on your run right now, you are crushing your run, you're killing it, you're being consistent. That's what I love. And thank you so much for uh, listening to Healthy Runner. All right, let's get into our first question. How about this? Um, all right, so the question is, and I really feel bad because this was the first one that I received. 
and I accidentally forgot to copy their name. So my apologies, because I can't give you a shout out for your question, but shout out to you because you literally submitted the first question. So the question is, hi, Dwayne, have a question for the podcast, please. It relates to hip and pubic bone pain or discomfort after my long runs. So 20 plus K. I've been running in varied terrain, gravel roads, um, trail tracks. It's an easy pace for these runs too. I get this eight out of 10 pain after my run and last maybe 12 to 24 hours. It hurts to walk or even go upstairs. It's never really happened before. I just figured it was from the constant pounding of my run, kind of like DOMS or delayed onset muscle soreness for those that are familiar with the acronym DOMS, um, but it's in the bone. I have no pain any other time. Is this something I can or should be doing? Or sorry, is there something I can or should be doing? Extra core strengthening. Um, also states that they're doing banded exercises a couple of times per week. And uh, thank you. All right. So thank you, listener, to uh, submitting your question. Um, this is a great question. And, you know, there are a couple of things in here that really um, start to throw up some what we call yellow flags and or red flags um, to me. And I definitely wanted to address this because there might be many of you runners out there right now who might be experiencing the same thing. So I guess why don't we even do this? Because there are many of you listening right now who might not be familiar with my background. So that might be actually a little helpful for me to share. For those that don't know, um, I am a physical therapist for the past 18 years and I uh, went into academics. So I also went down the kind of PhD um, realm and got my advanced doctorate, um, the DPT after going to school and getting my master's in physical therapy. So my background is kind of started out in the PT school um, or physio school for those that are international. And I was a strength and conditioning specialist first. So I did that while I was going through PT school and then went down the academia route, the research route, and then uh, started my you know business and started Spark Physical Therapy and then started our Spark Healthy Runner community and this podcast and our Facebook community. So just to give you a little context of where I'm coming from when I answer these questions, um, it's really coming from kind of medical background, um, physical therapists who specialize in working with runners, as well as my run coaching background. So there'll be some questions that relate to that. So this one right here, this actually perks up my ears for my medical screening background and what I teach all my PT students. Um, there are some things here that concern me a little bit. Um, the first is that your runs are easy pace, so they're not relatively really hard efforts. And you're getting bone pain and you rated the pain very high on your intensity level in eight out of 10. Now that's only one factor, but it's still high and your pain is lasting. So the behavior of your pain is lasting 12 to 24 hours. So that's a pretty good amount. This isn't pain that you're getting only during the run or only for 15, 20 minutes after your run. So pain that lasts this long is not a good sign. Um, the fact that it's also hurting with just walking or going up and down stairs tells me that your pain tissue irritability level, the irritability of your tissues is actually very high. So the fact this is not happened before, this isn't a chronic pain scenario or persistent pain. Um, yeah. And it, it, you describe it in the bone area um, and you're not having pain at any other time. So it seems that it is impacted by loading with running and you know things that really need to be screened out in this case is the bone and ruling out a stress fracture so i am going to highly recommend um, whoever did submit this question that you please get a medical evaluation um, by you know a trained medical professional whether or not you're in an area that you have access to a good physio um, you have direct access or go see a sports medicine physician um, to get this properly diagnosed because based upon what you've told me and i'm not trying to diagnose um, just based upon your question but if i was seeing you 
when working with you, then I would highly recommend that you get this further evaluated because it does sound and smell like there is some type of bone reaction, whether it is a stress reaction, stress fracture, and that's not something that you actually want to run through. So this is one of the rare times when we do actually need to listen to our bodies and you might need to, if this in fact is a stress reaction or stress fracture, then you might need to adjust your training. So I thought it was a great question. I wanted to share it with many of you who might be experiencing similar symptoms that has that same behavior, really a high pain intensity that lasts for a while after you're running, you're only getting pain with loading with running, but then it also persists and it's even painful just to walk or just to go up and down stairs. These are, you know, red flags in our mind um, as a medical professional. So please get this examined, get this checked out. All right. So now let's get to, um, oh man, Kathy. Okay. Kathy. Yes. Kathy, we got to get this checked out. Um, thank you so much for submitting the question. First off, um, I appreciate it, but hopefully that made some sense to you. Um, feel free to also message me if you have any follow-up questions, but yeah, we need to get this checked out. All right. Um, so Gene submitted the next question here. So Gene wants to know about stretching. Are there specific conditions or times which you should or should not stretch? So this is a great question. And this is a common question I get a lot. And so I guess let's cover the basics first. Um, stretching. There are many types of stretching. I'm going to cover the two most common types. Um, first is really going to be static stretching. There we go. I think you could see me a little better now is going to be static stretching, which is the traditional stretch. You think about you hold 30 to 60 seconds. This types of stretching should be done after your runs, after your workouts, when your muscles are filled with blood flow, they're more pliable. They are more likely to actually get the benefit of stretching. The other type of stretching we have is what we call dynamic stretching. This is movement-based stretching. This is movement prep. So this is where we have our five-minute dynamic warm-up um, that we have on our at Spark Your Training YouTube channel. Um, if you haven't seen that before, you haven't been doing any type of warm-up. There are many different warm-ups out there. Um, not to say that the one I created is better than other ones out there. The, the moral of the story is you need to move before you actually start running and you need to activate certain muscles and you need to actually move your legs through certain motions to kind of prep your body for the demands of running. So I've created a five minute dynamic warm up that has helped hundreds of runners, if not thousands that have seen it on the YouTube channel. Um, so check that out at spark your training on YouTube, and you will see that right in the uh, beginning, right in the center. It is the most viewed video that I have on my channel. Um, so you can check that out. So the other thing I want to address, and I think that Gene might be alluding to, there are certain conditions that it is not good to stretch. And we've spent a lot of time talking about this with our proximal hamstring tendinopathy. We've done a couple episodes on that, and that is one condition that I see a lot of runners um, who have this condition, and stretching is actually counterproductive, and usually stretching makes it worse. So if you've gone to a traditional, let's say, medical practitioner who said, yes, you have hamstring pain, I've learned in my training to stretch the hamstring because it's a muscle and you need to stretch it, it will get better. And where they assess and say, you have tight hamstrings. That's why you have hamstring pain. Here you go. Here's how you stretch your hamstrings. Um, trust me, that will not work for you. Um, so if it is someone who doesn't work with a lot of runners, um, like I have in my career, um, I, everyone that I see pretty much tells me that they've been stretching and it hasn't helped. It's only made it worse. Once I have them stop stretching and actually implement the loading specific exercises that I give them, their pain really starts to turn a corner and feel better. So there are certain conditions, and we've even talked about that a little bit with Achilles tendinopathy as well. Um, stretching may not be indicated, especially if it is at the insertional point where it connects to the heel bone. And we've done a couple episodes on Achilles tendinopathy as well. If you want to learn more information about stretching and you're new to our community, you're going to have to go back in the archives of going all the way back and wherever you listen to the podcast on Spotify, on Apple podcast, and go to episode six. 
So in that episode, I did a deep dive on, I titled it soft tissue care for runners. So this included foam rolling and stretching and really got into a little deep dive on stretching, what it actually does, what's the purpose, um, how do we do it? So check out that episode for those of you who are here on the live. Um, if you type in stretching into the comment box, I will shoot you the link. I have it readily accessible to get the replay of that episode, as well as the detailed blog explaining everything I just mentioned. So Gene, thank you so much for your question. Um, it was a great question. And I think you actually had a two-parter. Uh, so you had a second question here. Um, and that was how soon after a half marathon or marathon or longer, could you realistically, so I guess 50K, right? Or any uh, race longer. So really we're talking about our longer race distances, everyone. Um, so a half, a full marathon or an ultra right? Marathon. Could you realistically think of doing another? So now we're talking about kind of races back to back. Um, you know, what should you do? So it really depends on a number of factors. So one of them is your current level of health. Do you have any aches and pains? Are you currently recovering from an injury? If you are, then I'm going to really highly recommend you take the most conservative route possible. It also depends upon your level of conditioning. It also depends upon your level of experience. How many? So let's just insert any race distance, any of those, the half, the full, the ultra. How many of those have you run before? Is this your first? Is it your fifth? Is it your like me, let's say, I think I'm on 26 half marathons, right? I got a lot of half marathons under my belt, but I only have one marathon. So for me, I'll take me as the example. Could I do a half marathon and then do one a month later? Yes, because I have a lot of half marathons under my belt because my level of conditioning is very high and it's been consistent and I don't have any current injuries. So that's actually what I am doing um, this fall. So I'm running the Surf Town uh, Half Marathon in second week of September. And then one month later, I'll be running the Hartford Half, right? And that is, I've done that before. That's worked for my body because I, again, have that level of experience. I have that level of fitness and I don't have any injuries. If you have any of those factors whatsoever, then I really highly, highly recommend you wait a whole training cycle. That would be the best thing to do to avoid overtraining and or injuring yourself. So even going back to my example, putting that in context, in the fall, I mean, in the spring, when I ran my first half marathon in April, coming off of a long time period between October half marathon and April, I would not have run a half marathon in April and then one a month later in May because I was just coming off of the winter season where I really changed my focus and my, my goal of training at that time in the winter was really build up strength. Let's build up strength. I changed my training, my focus, strength training heavy, building up my base level of training, my mileage, and then getting into some of the speed work. Right. So my body really wouldn't have been in the best condition to do a bounce back half marathon right away. So again, what I did is I did another 12 week training cycle. So then we ran our summer half marathon and now I'm in my third 12 week training cycle. So you really want to think about um, cycling your training in order to train smart with proper progression, which is the fifth tip of our five tips to run strong and healthy, right? So we're looking for longevity here, right? That's why you're listening to this podcast to begin with. You want to be an injury-free lifelong runner. Running back-to-back -back long races is not putting yourself in the best position. Could you do it? Have people done it? Absolutely, right? There are ends of the spectrum. I am talking to the majority of you listening to this right? You're going to be in that bell-shaped curve right in the middle. The majority of you should not be doing back-to-back, -back, certainly not marathons or ultras, 
again, are there genetic freaks out there? Absolutely. I've met many of you guys out there. And I say kudos to you. I would personally not be able to do what you're doing. Um, right. So there are some people running some crazy run streaks and across the country, all that kind of stuff. That is right. We're talking about like the 1% of runners. The majority of you listening to this uh, should think training cycles. And if you're not sure what I'm talking about, if you want to learn more information about how to cycle your training to be smart throughout the calendar year and not just get this, um, you know, squirrel syndrome and be like, oh, there's a race here, race here. Oh, oh my goodness. This is one race I got to do. This is a race I got to do. And you keep signing up for races, right? Like how many of you are like that? I'm curious to see those of you who are here on the Facebook live. If you know you're like that, just type in like squirrel or put the squirrel emoji in the uh, comment box. If that's you, you see, you get like emails for races and you're like, oh, I got to do that one. I got to do that one. Oh my goodness. Run Disney. I got to do that one. Right. And you're signing up and you're like logging on, trying to get your spot. Um, it's not going to be in your best long-term interest to do back-to-back -back long races unless you're conditioned for it and you've trained for it. So hopefully that makes sense. And hopefully that is helpful for the majority of you guys uh, listening to this. If you want that episode and you want to learn more about training cycles, it's episode 50 on the podcast. That was the very first episode I did in 2021 uh, to kick it off in January. We talked training cycles and how to cycle your year in terms of training. So check that out. Um, again, if you're here on Facebook, just type in training cycles into the comment box. I'll just shoot you the link to the blog and the replay of that podcast episode. All right. So, whoa, Jess is popping on live on a road trip from the passenger seat. Oh my goodness, Jess. Thanks for tuning in. I will certainly need to get to your question. Thank you so much for submitting that. And yeah, Gene mentions the dopey challenge. Don't worry. I haven't signed up. Yes, Gene. Thank you very much. I am glad you have not signed up for that. Uh, my wife and I were actually just talking about that last week with everyone signing up for the Disney marathon. Um, we did the half marathon in 2020, right before the pandemic happened. And yeah, I've never seen ever, ever at a race that many injured runners ever. And it's because many of those folks were not training actually for the rigors of doing the dopey challenge, the goofy, right? Or like running four days in a row, four different races. So again, you, you really have to train your body for those demands of the training. All right. So let's get to our next question. Anna, thank you so much for submitting this. This was submitted via email. By the way, guys, if you're not on the um, Spark Healthy Runner email list, you can simply go to uh, sparkyourtraining.com, uh, jump on any of those kind of links, contact info, um, you know, drop your email there and you will get a uh, little bit more information on when uh, programs like our 5k program is released. Um, everyone on the email list gets that information first, as well as replays of the podcast, um, new blogs that come out, um, different information that I'll send out um, to my email list and uh, those listening. So Anna's on the email list. Anna says, I'd like to know how to start introducing trail running or making a transition from road to trail. I run on roads generally 10 to 14 kilometers three times per week. I am building up my long runs, aiming to get to at least half marathon distance as I start. I've done this distance before, but I have a tendency to get injured. I would love to start doing more trail running in the hills near me and to go for longer distances. However, I don't want to risk getting injured as in the past, I have had IT band pain, knee, plantar fasciitis, and proximal hamstring injuries. Any advice on how to make the transition? I know it is less reliable to look at distance and pace. So excellent question, Anna. Thank you so much for submitting it. Um, yeah, you've had all of the uh, common culprits there. Uh, those are the big heavy hitters that I help many runners with. Um, so I think the biggest thing for you to really consider is not so much changing to trail so much, but is actually strength training in order to run. So hopefully you're doing that. Um, running on trail is definitely going to be 
different demands to your muscles, you know, you're not as predictable, right? You're not running in one plane of movement in what we call the sagittal plane, and you're just running straight, right? You're often having to move a little side to side. So getting out of that plane of motion, you might need to, you know, dodge a rock, dodge a root. Um, you're going uphill, you're going downhill. So you're changing directions a little bit more. And some, some actually advocate that this is actually good for injury prevention because it really prevents the repetitive stress of just doing the same exact motion over and over again. However, you need to make sure that you have the foundational strength and your strength training is congruent to that type of activity, right? So making sure you're doing exercises that are just not in one plane of motion, that you're doing exercises that are going to the side. So an example would be like a side lunge, for an example, um, or you're doing some resisted side stepping. You're working your ankle muscles on the sides of your lower leg. So we call those the peroneal muscles. So especially those that have uh, chronically sprained their ankles and have loose ankles, right? Those are the important stabilizers in your ankle to prevent yourself from rolling your ankle. So I would make sure that you had good strength in your side ankle muscles, the peroneals. I would also make sure that you have really good strength in your hip abductor muscles. So that's the glute medius. We talk about that in our spark blueprint. Um, and that is the key muscle to helping prevent it band and knee pain. That is the most important muscle by far. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting a runner today. Um, we picked up on weakness in that muscle and, you know, she's going to make sure that she is really strength training that muscle in order to prevent the IT band pain, prevent knee pain, especially when we looked at her running mechanics and we saw that her knee went in, right? So those are the things that I think, Anna, are going to be really important for you to work on as you start to transition to trail is making sure you have good stability and strength. And for those that are new in our audience, again, if you guys haven't heard episode 70 on the podcast, I really did a deep dive into the importance of strength training in order to run um, and what muscles are best to strengthen for running. So if you just type in, um, muscles or strengthening muscles in the comment box for those on Facebook. I'll shoot you the replay of that episode, but you can check it out on the podcast episode 70, where I did kind of a deeper dive there. So hopefully that makes sense to you, Anna. And then also, you know, we do have free PDFs um, that I've created these injury resources for IT band pain, um, for runner's knee, for plantar fasciitis, hamstring uh, pain. So if you guys go to programs.sparkyourtraining.com, you will be able to get all those free resources. Um, those are like PDFs I've done with video links of specific exercises on all of those common running related injuries. So hopefully you've seen some of those as well, Anna. If not, just shoot me a message. I will uh, shoot those to you. All right, so let's uh, let's catch up on some comments here to give a little uh, break here um, in the action from all of these wonderful questions that we're getting. Coach Latoya is here in the live. She's late, but she's live. So you're here, and I am happy you're here. Um, so thanks for being here. And so let's get to uh, yeah, Francisco. I will definitely shoot you that um, that previous training on stretching. I think that would be really good for you, especially as you ramp up your training and the importance of taking care of our muscles, right? And recovering from these runs that we're getting in, that you're getting in with our team Healthy Runner Half Marathon program. All right, so let's get to the next question here. So this one was submitted by Grant. Uh, Grant, thank you so much. This was via email as well. Um, he says, pain in the butt, right side. How can I tell if it's high hamstring tendinopathy or piriformis syndrome, or sciatica, and then uh, questions about what are the treatments? All right, so this is definitely a loaded question here. I'm going to try to be as concise as possible for you, Grant. All right, so pain in the butt. It uh, Many people think it is piriformis syndrome. Um, however, it is rarely ever piriformis syndrome. So just to throw that out there, piriformis syndrome is going to be higher kind of in your mid-butt area. Proximal hamstring tendon pain is going to be right on your sit bone, and it's going to really be painful when you sit <laughs> for prolonged periods. Um, this is the first running injury that I ever experienced after my hip surgery. I think I shared 
that most of you probably know it. If not, I'll be real quick here. Uh, that's how I started running is I had a hip arthroscopy. So a hip scope to repair a torn labrum as well as a loose body I had in my hip. Surgeon after that said, stop running on the treadmill for cardio during your gym workouts. You only can run outside. I said, I've never run outside except when I was a kid, uh, played basketball, things like that. I started running outside, realized how amazing it was and never looked back since, right? So now we're 10 years out um, from that uh, glorious day that changed my life. And uh, unfortunately, I still had muscle imbalances after my hip surgery as I was recovering. And he really told me to start running a little too soon, not going to lie, because my glute strength wasn't there. And I developed this proximal hamstring tendinopathy and why I'm so passionate about getting this information out to more runners on, you know, best strategies, best treatment. So Grant, this is something that will definitely hurt with sitting, especially prolonged positions, and then maybe hurt during your runs toward the later mi miles or after you do hills. So anything that's on a significant incline, a um, type of run that has some elevation to it, as well as speed work. Piriformis syndrome is usually going to be only with running if you are significant over pronator. So your foot goes in, really pronates, your knee goes in, everything goes in. I actually also had this condition um, way back in college, um, and that is why I actually shared this in last week's episode on the podcast, uh, when we talked about, uh, orthotics and your piriformis muscle, it's your deep hip external rotator muscle. It slows down the rate at which we pronate when we run. So we call this our anti-pronation muscle up at the hip. And that's why it is one of the six key muscles that I say runners should strengthen because it's so critical at controlling what happens at the knee, as well as your foot and ankle to help prevent, posterior tibial tendon pain, shin splints, um, knee pain, runner's knee, as well as ID band pain. So it is one of those muscles you definitely want to strengthen. If you have piriformis syndrome, you could have a trigger point in your piriformis, but it's usually a weakness issue. So I see so many runners who are like, I have piriformis problems. I'm stretching it, stretching it, stretching it. It never gets better because it's usually not a muscle length problem. It is usually a muscle strength problem, and you might have a trigger point in there. So you can do yourself rolling techniques with a foam roller. That is one of the muscles that is in my five uh, muscles to foam roll for runners. Another really popular um, video on my YouTube channel. Um, so I show you exactly how you should be foam rolling the five key muscles. If you need that video, you're here on Facebook. Just type in foam roll video into the comment box. I'll shoot it to you. But again, it's pretty easy to find on my YouTube channel um, if you're listening on the podcast. Uh, so check that one out on how to foam roll your piriformis muscle because it is different. You have to cross your leg over and you have to bend the other leg to expose that muscle because it's deep in your butt. It's below the glute. So you got to get the glute max, the big beefy muscle out of the way in order to expose that piriformis muscle. Also, if you really truly have piriformis syndrome and it's not getting better with self-releasing techniques, whether it's a lacrosse ball, tennis ball, foam roller, then that's when some trigger point dry needling can be very helpful um, or deep tissue release by a massage therapist. I do dry needling. So that has worked wonders for that muscle to just get that muscle to, to kind of totally shut down, relax, and then you can work on the strength aspect of it. And then lastly, you mentioned sciatica. Sciatica is definitely going to be very different because this is a nerve entrapment. Typically it's coming from your lumbar spine. So your lower lumbar segments, that nerve gets entrapped. Typically you're going to have back pain. Usually it's going to be reproduced with prolonged positions such as sitting, but it's because of your spinal position, like sitting unsupported, not because you're putting pressure on the bone underneath your butt, like you get with hamstring tendon pain. This is also a different type of pain. It's usually shooting pain down your leg or pins and needles, numbness, tingling. So that's usually the description of pain when you have sciatica. It's going to feel nerve-like. It's going to feel electric shock, pins and needles, paresthesia. That, those are the types of kind of symptoms one would get. For hamstring tendon pain, it's going to be more of a dull ache with maybe some sharpness to it. Um, piriformis is usually going to be 
a spa it feels spasmy it feels tight it feels spasmy um like a, a dull ache also in the butt area but it's higher up in the butt so hopefully that answered your question grant again if it is in fact hamstring tendinopathy i have the ultimate hamstring guide for runners um, that i created so check that out um you can get that um if you go to sparkyourtraining.com forward slash hamstring hyphen guide you can get that uh guide or reach out to me just message me email me i believe you email me so send me an email i will send it to you um hopefully that clarifies some kind of buttock pain hamstring pain sciatic pain and if you're not sure what you are having and you're listening to this and it's not getting better definitely go see a local practitioner who works with runners who can definitely diagnose your condition. I'm not trying to use this podcast to diagnose all of you. Um, so I'm kind of using it to educate. And then if it is not getting better and it's getting worse, um, certainly go see a local medical practitioner who uh, works with runners and understands these types of running injuries. Uh, but thank you for submitting that question, Grant. So I think this is a good time to just take a little pause because we are talking about running injuries here. And we do talk a lot about running injuries on the podcast. And I am really excited about um, this new research study that I'm working on with a group of physical therapy students um, where we're trying to actually understand running injuries a little bit more. So we are conducting a research study. So if you are a runner who's been injured before, um, or even if you haven't been injured before, we want to hear from you. And we're seeking out those who run at least six miles a week and have been running for at least six months um, to participate in a Quinnipiac University uh, research study. It's basically a simple online survey that should just take under 10 minutes to actually um, fill out. Um, what I will do, if you're listening to this on the podcast, I will drop the link to the survey in the show notes. If you can please go to, um, you know, click on the show notes and click on that link, fill out the survey. It will greatly help us understand running injuries a little bit more so we can help you, right? So my whole goal is to get this information out to you guys, the masses, so we can be smarter runners and be injury-free lifelong runners, right? So one of the ways we do that is through science and research and I'm excited about working on this project. And this is kind of the first level stage of this research study is getting some information from you guys and doing this survey. So those who are listening on Facebook, if you want to participate in the research study, just type in research study into the comment box. I will shoot you the link to that study so you can be able to fill out the survey. But let's get back to our questions that you submitted. Um, so here's a question actually from someone on our coaching team, uh, Coach Kat. She says uh, she gets this question a lot, as do I. So I definitely wanted to address this one because I'm sure there are many of you out there who have this question and are wondering uh, the answer to it. So Coach Kat says, when you have a strength training and run in the same day, which one do you do first? And I literally answered this question today for a runner. So I uh, definitely get this. This is like literally a daily question I get. Um, so because everyone who is listening to this podcast is a runner, and yes, you are a runner, even if you don't consider yourselves a runner, because you're listening to a running podcast. Let's be honest here, guys. You are not a professional bodybuilder. You are not a power lifter. If so, you'd be listening to a power lifting podcast or a bodybuilding podcast, right? This is not the Arnold Schwarzenegger podcast. This is the Healthy Runner podcast. So because you are a runner, we want to prioritize our running first and foremost, meaning you're going to go for your runs first, and then you're going to do your strength training. So that is definitely the best order. I've had many runners do it the opposite way and their legs feel terrible for their run. And then it changes their running form. And then it's going to affect your pace. It's going to affect the physiologic benefits you need as a runner to get in the training. So definitely do your run first if they're on the same day and then get your strength training in after. For the majority of you probably listening to this, you are going to want to program your easy runs before your strength training. For those that are advanced and you're looking for really building up speed, you've built up a base level of training and you're at the point. And honestly, for me, 
This is the first time. Uh, shout out to my coach, Coach Lou, um, who programmed this for me in this last training cycle is actually doing some hard effort sessions on the day of your strength training. So kind of keeping your hard days hard, your easy days easy. Um, and that's only a training philosophy that is for those that have been conditioned for years. We're talking, I'm not talking about like three months. I'm talking about years and you've been consistently running. You've been consistently strength training. Um, that's when you want to do that and combine harder days with strength training. Because most of you who are probably listening to this are not ready for that stage yet. And I, I really want to stress that because I've heard that on other running podcasts and coming from a physical therapy perspective and treating many running injuries, it is usually caused by that type of training. Um, it's doing too much too soon, right? Too much load. And a lot of um, runners out there don't have that level of fitness to actually do a hard speed session, whether it's intervals or a tempo run or a threshold run, and then go ahead and do some strength training right after it. Again, this is reserved for those that are a lot more conditioned, have years under their belts of running and strength training, um, are running a lot faster than, you know, certainly than I can run. Um, that's when those types of workouts come into play. So if that is not you, then you want to think of doing easy runs followed by strength training. So that would be the order. So thanks so much, Coach Cat, for that question. Um, hopefully that was helpful. And I'm just checking out uh, Tanya. Thank you so much for joining here on the live. And um, let's get to our next question. All right. So our friend, Jen Giles. Jen Giles submitted a question. Um, Jen is a registered dietitian. She's been on the show before. Um, she had an amazing, amazing episode that was very popular um, that I continually give my clients to listen to. Episode 53, Jen talked about what should I eat and drink for long runs. Um, very, very informative episode. Um, but Jen has a question uh, that she submitted. Um, she said, what is a calcaneal stress fracture? And then she puts in parentheses, self-diagnosed. And why does it hurt like heck to press in that area, but it doesn't hurt at all to run on it? Um, it did hurt like a bear to run on it for 18 months, but now it doesn't hurt at all while running, only when I press on it. So, and then she also asked, could it be something else? So just to kind of set... Uh, so I can understand what Jen is asking here. She says that it did hurt to run on it for 18 months and it doesn't hurt at all while running now, but it only hurts to press on it. So could it be something else? So this is definitely very hard to diagnose based upon the information that you've given me. Um, but based upon what you've told me, let's talk about some of the options right? So what could it be? Um, so is it a stress fracture? Um, stress fractures will definitely be more severe pain and will also give you night pain as well as in when they are severe, they're going to give you swelling. So based upon what you've reported, you didn't report any of that. I don't know for the last 18 months, if it was giving you pain at night, it was giving you a little swelling around that area and now it's healed. Not sure. Um, but that's really what you want to look at if it's actual stress fracture. Based upon what you told me, it doesn't sound like that was it because it sounds like you continued to run through it and you didn't really alter your training. Usually when it's a stress fracture that will not heal and you will still have pain with running. Um, so you mentioned pain pushing on it. Pain pushing on it could be a number of uh, different things. And it depends upon where is the location that you're pushing on. If you're pushing on under your heel, that is the site for plantar fasciitis. Um, it's basically right under your heel bone toward the inside part. So the medial part, we call that the medial calcaneal tubercle is the bone that the fascia attaches to. If it's pain there and you get pain when you take your first step in the morning. That's the cardinal feature of plantar fasciitis. Um, that's what that would be. 
you didn't mention any pain about first thing in the morning. So I'm going to assume that's not you. So could it also be bursitis? It is rare to get bursitis in the area, but it can happen. So you could have bursitis. The cardinal sign for that is swelling. You're going to get a little pocket of swelling, and it's usually on the back part of the heel. So I'm not sure if that's where your injury location is. Um, you mentioned the heel. It's not really going to be under the heel um, and impact of running so much, but bursitis is usually going to be, we call it retrocalcaneal bursitis. It's on the back part of your heel bone, the calcaneus, and you're going to see like a little pocket of swelling and it's very visible. And that's how, you know, you diagnose bursitis. The other thing is, could it possibly be heel pain due to a nerve entrapment of the S1 nerve? So the lumbar nerve root. So that comes out of your lower back. Again, as I mentioned earlier in another question of sciatica, this will typically be more like pins and needles, and um, you might have low back pain associated with it. So we definitely need to rule out that it's not coming from your lumbar spine, and it is in fact coming from the heel. So there's a lot of differential diagnosis there, Jen. Um, definitely would recommend that you get a good evaluation um, to properly diagnose, but you got like four different possibilities. Um, it doesn't sound to me that you actually had a stress fracture because it sounds like it's gotten better and you didn't alter your training. So typically with stress fractures, it's just going to keep getting worse and worse and worse if you don't alter your training. So hopefully that's helpful for you. Um, let's get to our next question. So we're on a roll here. This is good. And yeah, oh my goodness, man, time flies when you're answering questions. Okay. Yeah. Like I said, guys, you guys came in strong with questions, but let's get to one from our Instagram uh, follower here from at the Spark Your Training uh, Instagram page, uh, Jesse, uh, at Jesse James Pointer uh, asked, his question is, I am training for my second half in November and a full in January. All right. So second half marathon, doing the first full marathon in January. I eat in a feeling um, window between noon. I'm assuming that it was feeding window between noon and 7 p.m. and eat accordingly to an ancestral diet. My question is about fueling for training and race day while fat adapted low carb. I do not eat sugar oils, processed foods, carbs, unless from vegetables and no grains. So how does someone on my diet fuel for training and long runs? So Jesse, this was actually a great, great question. And we actually covered this in um, the previous episode I just mentioned with our registered dietitian friend, Jen Giles. Um, so Jen actually covered exactly what you're talking about in episode 53. So check out that episode. Um, it is a little bit beyond my scope um, as a physical therapist and run coach to really dive into the specific nutritional demands and the diet um, that you are following. From my, from my surface level understanding is that the fat adapted diet and low carb diet, though popular, and many do it for weight loss, um, goals and a lot of people lose weight on it. It is not the best for fueling, especially, especially for long runs and for your race goals of a half marathon and most importantly for a marathon. So you need a lot of nutritional demands and fuel in order to fuel properly for a marathon. For all of those double digit long runs you're going to be getting in, you're out there for two, three, four hours during those runs. You cannot do that on a fat adapted diet. Um, it, again, from my basic physiology, biology, human anatomy, physiology, all the courses I've taken, um, that's not how our bodies work. That's not how we expend energy. And that will certainly, certainly hurt your performance if that is your goal. And your goal is to actually get a pretty decent time and or finish the marathon, honestly, because a lot of people don't finish their first marathon because they bonk. They just literally body shuts down at mile 20 and they don't have enough energy to actually complete the marathon. So if you would like to actually complete that marathon, I would highly recommend you check out episode 53, listen to some of the knowledge that Jen uh, dropped in that, reach out to someone like Jen um, who does this for a living and actually um, helps those uh, be able to run in, you know, 
modify basically what your nutritional demands are and really teach you the principles and how to fuel properly. So hopefully that will be helpful to you. And then maybe we'll get to another nutritional question that we had from Rochelle. Uh, she submits this via email. Um, her question is, do you suggest calcium supplements for long distance runners? And again, this is going to be based upon the knowledge that I've uh, learned along the way, as well as, again, some of my basic, um, you know, PT school uh, nutrition knowledge that we do get. And my answer is going to be, it depends on your bone health. So are you postmenopausal? Do you have a family history of osteopenia where you're starting to lose some bone density or osteoporosis and you've had family members uh, grandmothers, moms who have had osteopenia, osteoporosis, did the females on, you know, one of your sides of your family have a tendency to get this? Are you nutrition or uh, nutrient deficient, right? So what is your diet? Is there a big block of um, nutrition that you're not getting? If you are following, let's say dairy-free or vegan um, diet, plant-based and are you not supplementing? Are you, so it really depends upon those questions. You know, are you eating dark, you know, uh, green leafy vegetables, right? Such as broccoli and kale. I just had some broccoli for my dinner. Um, or are you having like cereals and milks that are calcium fortified? So if the answer is you're getting all of those uh, nutrients that I mentioned that have calcium in them, or you're getting in calcium fortified foods, you probably don't need a supplement based upon what I know about, you know, calcium and how the body works. But again, if you are at risk and you have a family history and you're postmenopausal and you're concerned about bone health, you've had a history of fractures then definitely seek out your doctor, um, have a conversation whether or not calcium supplements are right for you. Um, but I would say that for most runners who do get in calcium within their diet, they probably don't need to supplement, right? Unless you have some of those risk factors for poor bone health, um, so hopefully that was helpful. And I feel like I could just keep going on with questions, but I, I do need to wrap this up at some point. So let me uh, try to take uh, one or two more because I don't want this to be a super long episode that no one listens to. Um, but hopefully these are helpful for you guys. For those of you who are live, let me know, Like, is hearing some of this stuff helpful? Type in helpful into the comment box if you're liking this format of just answering your listener questions. Uh, Thomas asks, Thomas has a question he submitted via email. He says, I recently started doing some speed work three by 800 meters, um, as part of half marathon training, but I'm getting a pain in my inner central thigh of the left leg while running fast. So, uh, left leg, um, inner central thigh. So basically mid portion of his uh, leg is femur bone. It sounds like um, the inner part is going to be your adductor muscles. So those are your inner thigh muscles, the groin muscles. Uh, it goes away when he stops. So he's only getting it when he runs fast. Um, any exercise that will help with that. So based upon what you did tell me, it does sound like it is your adductor muscles, which could get a little bit more activation with speed work. Absolutely. Like I always feel my adductors after a hard race. Um, especially a really hard half marathon that I go after and really kind of push the limits a little bit. Um, adductors are always sore. Um, so it does sound like an adductor strain. Um, you know, it is something that we want to watch out with, um, make sure it's not getting worse. And, you know, the fact that the pain goes away. So this is actually a good contrast to the first question we had where pain lingered for 24 to 48 hours. This is a good sign that pain goes away. So it's telling us it's not most likely high tissue irritability or even some bone pain that we need to be concerned about. Um, in general, if it is truly an adductor strain, what I would definitely recommend for a client I was working with was doing some soft tissue releasing of that muscle and you know, doing some foam rolling of your adductors, making sure you thoroughly warm up and do a five minute dynamic warm up definitely before your speed work. So and this is actually good. I was even planning on mentioning this. This is good for anyone listening, doing speed work, how you should be doing your speed work. 
you're going to warm up for a mile. Easy conversational pace, running, get that blood flow into your body, and then you go through your movement prep, your dynamic warm up, some drills, some leg swings, some gentle plyometrics, some skips, some bounding, right? So there are many different things that you can do to turn on your muscles and get them firing as they need to fire when you are running those repeat 800s, right? So make sure you're warming up thoroughly. And then as far as like treating the adductors, there are different strengthening exercises you can do, um, especially working them eccentrically, which means during the lengthening phase of the muscle. So I like to do this for those that have adductor, you know, strains and a history of adductor problems on like a slide board, or you can do this on a slippery floor. If you have hardwood floors or a kitchen floor with a towel, or if you're wearing a sock. And you do like a lateral lunge. So if you envision doing a lateral lunge, let's say it's your left side, the left leg is going to slide out to the side. So you're actually slowly lowering. You're using your adductor muscle to slowly lower out. And then you're using your right leg to stand up. So that is one way that we can eccentrically work that leg um, as it's slowly lowering out. So I'm sure you can YouTube, uh, ways to strengthen your adductor muscle eccentrically, but that in general is usually what most runners need to strengthen and build up the resilience in the adductor muscle. So then it can tolerate the demands of that speed work. You know, could you benefit from a little bit of stretching? Possibly again, I would go more dynamic stretching, uh, movement-based stretching. So some side leg swings, um, as opposed to the old, good old, like sit on the floor and do the butterfly to kind of stretch your inner thigh, uh, groin muscles. So hopefully that was helpful for you. Uh, Thomas, thank you so much for your question. And I'm glad that Kathy says this is helpful. Jean says this is helpful. She's listening. Well, uh, she's doing her hamstring strengthening. Awesome. Love it. Love it. Love it. Jean, uh, keep up with that hamstring strengthening. So yeah, guys, I think we're going to wrap this puppy up because I don't want to go over too much of an hour. So I apologize if I haven't gotten to your question. I have them here. Let's like table this for a future episode because these are great. These are great questions that you guys submitted. Uh, so thank you first and foremost for submitting your questions. I'm going to put like a hard stop here and highlight uh, what I need to get to uh, after this. And Hopefully we'll be able to bring this to a future episode. Uh, as a friendly reminder for those that are got all the way to the end here on Facebook, we have our 5K program. If you're a new runner, beginner runner, um, 5K runner, and you really want to crush 5K this fall, we have a team healthy runner program just for you to be able to do that. So you got to sign up quick. Uh, if you want to learn more about the program, type in 5K program into the comment box or team. And those that do comment and join our team, this week and you comment on this video, um, you will be in for a free race registration to the Southington Apple Harvest uh, race, uh, road race. So it's a great road race uh, that we do here locally in Connecticut. And I just want to say thank you to all of you who tuned into this episode, whether you were watching the replay on our Spark Your Training YouTube channel, which I mentioned a bunch of times, got a lot of videos, a lot of resources there for you. If you listen live here on Facebook, within our Healthy Runner Facebook community, remember guys, every Monday night, we go live within the Healthy Runner Facebook group. So don't forget about us. Keep us in mind on your schedule. Check out the events tab within our Healthy Runner Facebook group to find out what our topics will be, what our future episodes will be. And thanks to all of you who are killing your runs right now, listening to me in your ears. I greatly appreciate it. I never, ever take it for granted. Um, as always, guys, stay active, stay healthy, and just keep running. Until next time. 